Musical Truth. But I didn't find any books on the market that dealt with hip hop from a spiritual, occult, metaphysical aspect. It's very hard to find uh, someone who played a prominent role in one of the bands who does not come from a career military type family. The Beatles, you know, the album Sgt. Pepper was intended to announce the death of Paul. You've got a grave there. Musical Truth is the groundbreaking new book from DJ turned author Mark Devlin, available now at Amazon or from musicaltruthbook.com. You're here because you know something, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there. Don't worry, don't be afraid, ever. This is just for now. I'm picking up the vibration. I'm picking up the vibration. I'm picking up the vibration. You're with Good Vibrations, we're on volume 98, heading towards the 100 rapidly at the tail end of 2016, which has been quite an incredible year. On this volume, I'm on the line to Emily Moyer, aka Emily Technobrat. Emily, welcome. Thank you very much, Mark. Glad to be here. So you're the co-host of Off Planet Radio and TV alongside Randy Morns, and I guested on your show uh, this month, and now we're turning the tables, so, uh, you know, you're in the hot seat yourself. Yeah, excellent. Glad to be here. It's, um this will be the first chance I have to do an extended a talk about um, dance music. It's been spoken about a little bit on our show, um, but I'm really looking forward to have looking forward to having this uh, opportunity to dig deep into it with you. So. Good. Well, I really want to get into that because it's an area that I've not discussed yet on this series in any great depth, but I know there's a lot of information to uncover, and I know that it fits into previous volumes that we've done and other work that I've put out there. So I'm looking forward to putting this piece of the jigsaw in place and getting your perspectives on some of this stuff. So I really want to explore the parallels between specifically the hippie and counterculture scene of the 1960s, which has been covered many, many times before, and the so-called Second Summer of Love. So this would be the acid house rave explosion of the 1980s in the UK and the legacy that that paved the way for, the things that it brought in, because I'm convinced there are the same fingerprints of the social engineers that can be found with both movements. It's merely a case of identifying what those fingerprints are and fleshing out a bit of the detail, you know? So we've spoken about uh, wanting to do that today. And I'm very familiar with how the Acid House rave scene got started in the UK back in the late 1980s because I remember it. I went out partying. I was a part of that. And we'll be covering some specifics on that in an upcoming volume that I've got with a guy called Mike Angel, uh, based here in the UK. To my mind, this was the burgeoning scene which eventually opened the floodgates for the worldwide explosion of what's come to be known as electronic dance music. But I'm less familiar with how all that got started in the US. Uh, which I know was many years behind the UK. You know, it was some years later that it got established there. So I wonder if you could fill me in with your take on how what's come to be known as electronic dance music. So we're talking about club music, stuff that's listened to by young people in nightclubs and at parties around the world. How did that get a foothold on that side of the pond initially? Sure. So... You know, I'm I'm 41 years old, so I can't say that I was around exactly when it got started. Um, I've done a fair amount of research and learned from people. Um, you know, so I think that it did. It, it actually it, it developed here at, at a similar time as it was developing in, developing in England. And I'd say that in the beginning, maybe it was more music that was developing here in terms of Detroit techno and Chicago house, as opposed to a specific kind of rave or party scene here that developed a little bit later from what I, you know, from what I understand in, you know, particularly in places like New York where they were having, you know, break in rave parties and things that came, you know, shortly after what was going on in England and it has developed, you know, dance music has always been uh, very, very popular in England. Like there they played on the radio and they always have, they have like P Tong, people like that who have, you know, radio shows where they feature dance music. Here, that isn't always the case. Like maybe you'd have one radio station that one hour a week would play dance music. It might be a little different now. I don't really listen to the radio. So it developed in a different, slower way here. And it developed both in the club scene. There was you know, both a club scene and, and, you know, a rave scene. And here the rave scene was you know, a combination of um, 
kinds of, you know, warehouse type parties, and then also began to become things that were festivals and tours, which you're still seeing today. But it has absolutely exploded in a way, you know, that there's so many levels to the dance music scene here. I mean, you can think about it in terms of there's still some of those traditional kinds of raves that people think about where you see kids kind of dressed up and, um, you know, it's music in, in, a, in a large square building, but it's really separated itself more into three kind of three components that I see. And that is the underground dance music scene, which is what I'm a part of. And I very rarely wade into the other stuff anymore. I, there's some crossover for some people who are in my scene. Um, so what I, you know, there's, there's an underground warehouse scene that basically consists of um, one room events that are generally focused on one type of music. And for the most parts, it is at this point, adults and older people. I don't see too many super young people uh, attending those. And the quality of the music, in my opinion, at those is much better. And there is, while there's still some strange things going on, there isn't the level of manipulation and control that I see in the other two levels. So then the other thing that I would talk about is some burning man. And there are festivals that would be, that I would consider to be related to burning man. And these are sort of maybe what the closest parallel to the kind of counterculture hippie scene you were seeing in Laurel Canyon uh, in the sixties and seventies. And so there's music going on at these events. There's art going on. And there's also a level of um, discussion and in some cases talks and workshops going on about quote unquote consciousness and things of this sort. Hmm. Um, and everybody I think is familiar with Burning Man. Um, it's a, it's a really uh, interesting thing. I've never been, um, I would probably like to go, but at this point I've done enough research and I'm aware of enough things that I'm, I'm hesitant. Um, if people are interested in learning about Burning Man, there's a guy named Steve Outram who's been speaking about this. He did a, a series of really good interviews with um, Jan Urban and Joe Atwell. Um, yep. I recommend listening to him talk about Burning Man. But from what I can see, there's some really cool stuff there, but there is a level of like fantasy society and a level of... Um, like there it's it's first of all you have an event that's on government owned land and so that should tip people red off flag red flag number one <laughs> red flag number one and you know it's i i suspect from some things i've been able to draw that this was very likely started by you know think tanks or intelligence agencies you know the same way that you know you can tie tavistock to things with you know, the 60s and 70s, rock music, military intelligence. Um, I, you know, it's funny. This past year before Burning Man, there was articles that came out say, like that were talking about how the FBI had requested having a private camp set up for them there. And then that there was a, a Burning Man saying, no, they weren't going to do that. And I actually think that they created that story because people were starting to be on to the, are starting to be on to the fact that there is an intelligence factor there. Mm. So... I think they wanted to make it look like, oh, this is just becoming an issue and we're doing everything we can to keep it out. Hmm. I think that uh, it will probably become clear over the next few years, you know, that this is what's going on. Hmm. Um, and that event, that, that, that event is absolutely loaded with dark occult symbology and sort of uh, pagan overtones and stuff. And you right. often find that the world of the dark occult is very much intertwined with the world of military intelligence. Those two are bedfellows. They go hand in hand. Where you find one, you find the other in so many cases. Absolutely. Um, I think there's, you know, the whole event is a sort of mock ritual sacrifice, the burning of the man. It well, hopefully mock anyway. Right, right, right. It, 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 there's, there's some. When I think about it, and I haven't done, you know, enough particular research into this topic, but when I think about it, it reminds me of the cremation of care ceremony at Bohemian Grove. Yeah, sure. Yes. Or, or so, the movie The Wicker Man, right? I, I haven't seen that, but, but okay. I, you know, I can imagine, what, you know, what you're speaking of. And my feeling about it is, a lot of the people involved at Burning Man go there, and and there's some people I'm sure that. 
you know, a lot of people involved in the core organization of it and some of the artists and, and sound and light engineers and stuff there have a range of knowledge about occult and esoteric, you know, topics and symbols. And just definitely being occult or esoteric itself isn't necessarily a bad thing or a good thing. It's how it's used. But when you have a situation where you have some people knowing what this stuff means and can be used for and others who are just going there and watching the show and thinking it's cool and having an, an experience and whatever and don't really understand the possibilities of what the, those signs, symbols, um, and things can be our, our portals to or doorways to it's a dangerous situation you have sure. a small group of people with a lot of power and influence over people who are wide open they're there they think they're free they're thinking they're having their revolutionary rebellious experience and most of them are on drugs and that's the other thing like this like this this idea that it's on government land and obviously at this point they're aware of the fact that there's massive drug use going on there and the exactly, fact that it has exactly. been broken up or busted tells me that we may even be looking at a situation where this whole the whole thing, and I would say this is true of the the segment that I'm going to talk about next, but a little bit different way of large festivals, the other kinds of festivals, corporate festivals. But I would go so far as to say that we could be looking at, at like a field laboratory experiment. Exactly, and, I think so. You know, you can do some research. I've just begun looking deeper at this. Um, but there's an MK Ultra sub project. There's two that I think could relate to this. One called MK Search, and one called MK Often. And these both deal with <clears throat> aspects relating to <clears throat> sort of paranormal, occult, and the inner workings of the mind, as well as using you know human and animal, hu they, you know, human and animals in you know toxin and drug, t testing them for results and sort of observing. Yeah. Um, let me just let me just jump in here a second, Emily, while we're talking about festivals, because I've made a note of some of the names of the big dance music festivals that take place in the US and beyond all around the world, basically. And so many of them have esoteric, mystical, spiritual, even Illuminati kind of overtones in their names. So uh, some of the ones that I just wanted to bring up are there's a big one called Dream State takes place in San Francisco, San Bernardino, uh, the site of one of those false flag shootings last year, which kind of put it on the map for many people uh, and other places around the world. Then you've got A State of Trance, which is Armin Van Buren's brand with lots of interest in Saturn symbology and the logo. There's A Trance Nation, uh, so a play on trance again, which of course is a subgenre in itself. That takes place in the Netherlands. Then you've got Luminosity, also in the Netherlands. Uh, you've got Euphoria, which kind of gives uh, the impression of an ecstasy rush uh, velvet hypnotized takes place in bali you've got one called atlantis in australia there's spring awakening chicago awake in germany awakening fridays in la dream beach in spain then you've got a few that seem to have some transhumanism type overtones electronic family so what is that the merging of uh, technology and humanity that takes place in the netherlands china and other places digital society in leeds in the uk digital dreams is a massive one in toronto then you've got other futuristic kind of overtones tomorrow world atlanta tomorrow land in belgium future music festival australia uh new horizons jakarta and so it goes on and the way i put that list together is they're all events that have been played at by paul van dyke who is one of the leading djs producers in this field all i did is went through his gig list for the last couple of years and came up with all those names so there's some interesting overtones there in terms of the way these events are named yeah Yes. So, okay. So there's a lot, there's a lot there. And so, yes, you bring up a very good point that the names are our clues at this point. They are just putting, you know, I know that because I've been around in the scene for a long time and I, most of the people in the scene are not nefarious and most of them don't even have any clue what's going on. There are some that probably sure. have some, you know, but there most people is, just want to party their tits off and they think no more of it. And some people are really into the music, particularly in the scene that I am involved in underground, but there is, you know, this weird thing that I've always recognized, you know, there's this, um, there is a hidden hand. There is, there is something influencing those names. So first of all, I want to say that it's interesting that that's Paul Van Dyke's list. Paul Van Dyke is a huge, very famous trans DJ. And 
I will say one thing. He's actually a decent DJ. I don't particularly care for trance music, but he's actually a skilled DJ who produces decent music, which is different than what I would say about most of the people who play these large, you know, what I call, the, 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 most of the things that you just named there are what I would term corporate events or corporate festivals. Absolutely. So that's something different than Burning Man and different than what I'm involved in with the underground dance music scene. And this is the area where I have, on a certain level, the most concerns, these corporate festivals. Um, because there is definitely a hidden hand. Um, and so th uh, this will take me into something that I, okay, an area that I was definitely wanting to get into. There's a lot of troubling aspects to this. You have a situation with these large festivals where, um, first, actually last night I was having trouble sleeping and I ended up on Netflix watching a little bit of a documentary that was about that Tomorrowland party that you, yeah. that you referenced. The one in Belgium, and right? The, it's, uh, it's now all over the world, including in the United States. And okay. I've heard stories about things I've heard, I mean, even people who are what I would consider sort of unaware have noticed weird things about this festival. Oh, Some the logo said, the logo to it has an all-seeing eye right in the middle of it. So. Well, even worse, it's a butterfly with an all-seeing eye on right, top of it. Right, right. So to me, that is indication that we're looking at possibly something related to Project Monarch. Yeah. As well as, the you know, all of the, all of the possible subliminal and programming and programs that go along with the all-seeing eye and it's also i think a hint if you learn how to read these things that we are being surveilled at these events we yeah. are being watched that this is a, an experiment i watched a little bit of this video i had to turn it off it was making me almost want to vomit it was kind of like watching some kind of like um it did first of all it didn't seem like a real documentary it seemed like they were using actors to me but it was like an, an you remember those ads for like Benetton or Calvin Klein, where they're trying to make it seem that, like, you know, just this is a wonderful world and we're accepting of everybody. And it, it was like, it's like the ultimate promotion of, of, of oneness, right? Well, of, like, <laughs> it's interesting you mentioned that because I had in that list of festivals that I was reading out uh, that Paul Van Dyke had played at, the one that I didn't mention is his own event, which is called We Are One. <laughs> That's his own brand. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So that there is, I mean, Okay, and this is where it gets to a really difficult and disturbing spot because, sure, one of the things we all love about music is it has the ability to bring people together, to pull down barriers, to pull down differences, and for the period of time when we're enjoying, enjoying music together, you know, we see each other just as humans, just like each other. And, so, and that's a great thing about music, and that's something that shouldn't be lost. But when it is being marketed that way, that to me is a, a push at globalism, a push at, quote unquote, a new world order, okay? Mm -hmm. This idea that we are all the same, so we no longer even need to respect each other's differences. Yep. You know what I mean? Um, yes, yeah, a homogenized me, society where there's no individuality and uh, we're all, it's almost like communism, isn't it? It's just uh, everyone's it, the same. It, it is. It, I'd, say it, it, I'd say it's worse than communism. It's fascism because it's a corporate create. It, it, the corporation is creating a situation that turns everybody into homogenized milk. You know what I mean? Like it right. is. Yeah, it, it's you know, if it was just, it, it's not in any way a horizontal thing. It's horizontal for the people that are buying tickets and going to it, but they're going there and they're worshiping an idol. I mean, the way that they have. I was when I was watching this Tomorrowland thing. And I've seen this at other festivals, the way they have the DJ up high and the stage almost looks like an altar. It's got all sorts of occult symbols on it. Yep. And it's, it's, it's built it literally, if you shrunk it down, it could look like some kind of religious or satanic altar. Um, and, and you remember you know, that the tune by Faithless called God is a DJ. That seems yeah. to be the way they're portraying DJs at these events. They are messianic type figures holding out their arms and they've got the throng of worshipful, faithful, the worshipful faithful gathered there in their thousands, uh, hanging on their every move, you know. Hanging on their every move. And I would say at this point, some of the music of these festivals has gotten so ridiculous that you have this person up there almost taunting and mocking people by seeing how stupid of music he can play and still get them to move in unison and like be like looking at him like he's the second coming of Christ. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's disturbing. And one of the things when the, the rave scene first got started and just certainly an element of, of the underground scene that I still am a part of is it, it's, it's the, the DJ is on the same, le like the, the DJ table is not raised. 
it's on the same level as everybody else, and it's just a table that has all the equipment that they need up there. And the things I go to, the people actually use all the different equipment, not just pretend like they're using it while really something plays, you know, really they're using, you know, the auto feature on uh, Ableton or Tractor or whatever. You know yeah. what I mean? Well, you've got uh, people like Paris Hilton now that are going out there as DJs. Who believes that Paris Hilton is mixing those tunes, you know? It's going to be a pre-prepared mix on a laptop probably by some producer, and she's just miming the actions and just standing yeah. there looking like a mind controlled uh mk ultra subject you know in front of the crowd who lap up everything she does exactly so, like i mean i don't know i i don't know what events she plays at and i don't i don't know but it, let's just imagine let's just say for the sake of imagine that she i don't think she's played at tomorrowland but if she did that would be the, the monarch butterfly sitting right there with the all-seeing eye Absolutely. on top yeah there and you know, go it, it, it's kind of you know it's really sick if you understand it and what i want to you know go to the these large what's going on with these large festivals is probably one of the most disturbing things to me and um I'm, i want to point people who are listening to you know you had a really um first of all i want to thank you for writing your book because you really get into some stuff that that actually even helped me pull together my thoughts about some of the things i wanted to talk about um and there's a chapter called the word of todd yeah our little section and this guy was talking about how basically it was a guy who was involved in a, a company that was basically controlling all ends of the music scene he was involved in mm -hmm. all the corporations all the festivals the ticketing agencies or whatever and he was talking about how they put spells on the master recordings and it gives them access to people they would never have access to because the spell is in the music that people are listening to yeah let me so just let, now, let, let, sorry let me just say this is a guy called john todd collins also known as lance collins and if people want to hear what he had to say back in the 1970s if you google john todd music industry i think you will find the piece of audio that you're referring to where he talks about casting spells on master tapes so people might want to do that just to set some background to this sorry yeah okay Perfect. No, no, perfect. That's excellent. So I'm going to point people to a company called SFX Entertainment. And I'm going to read you a little blip about SFX Entertainment here. So SFX Incor Entertainment Incorporated is the largest global producer of live events and digital entertainment content focused exclusively on electronic music culture and other world-class festivals. XFX's mission, mission is to provide electronic music fans with the best possible live experiences, music discovery, media, and digital connectivity. SFX was born out of the technology revolution and produces and promotes a growing portfolio of live events that includes leading brands such as Tomorrowland, Tomorrow World, Mysteryland, Sensation, Stereosonic, Electric Zoo, Disco Donnie Presents, Life in Color, Rock and Rio, Nature One, Mayday, Decibel, Q Dance, and React Presents, as well as the innovative ticketing service Flavor Us. SFX also operates Beatport, the principal online resource for EMC DJs and a trusted destination for the growing EMC community to discover and stream music, follow DJs, and keep abreast of news, information, and events, in addition to offering year-round entertainment to EMC fans around the globe through other digital assets. Okay, so that pretty much sums up what was going on with the John Todd guy, right? So there, there, here you have... Control so of, of all, everything control of everything and the most it's all disturbing they, they, they bought up and the guy the guy who owns sfx entertainment is a guy named steve uh, hold on let me see hold on. his name is i have it right here S uh, S sillerman his name is uh, his name is uh, is siller is uh, robert sillerman and this is what he he went around that's kind of what he does Earlier in the 2000s, he went up and bought uh, bought up a lot of different uh, concert companies and sold them to Clear Channel, did the same kind of consolidation. But this is what he had to say about his company. I know nothing about electronic dance music. <clears throat> I really don't. Of course, I've listened to it. And I understand its appeal. It's borderless. It's free. It's energetic. It's a party. It's a party in your mind, and I understand that. But I sit in the meetings to the extent that they are meetings, and I meet the people whose places we're buying, and I haven't a fucking clue what they do or what they're talking about. Not a clue. And I love it. I just love it. And to me, that is just disgusting. Okay? So he's... Great he, I mean, grounding. Great grounding to be a key figure in that scene, right? Well, also, for the perfect... Obviously, just an arrogant asshole who cares nothing about what he's doing. And while he may not be the kind of evil hand we're talking about, he is the kind of tool that the controllers need to get hold 
of all of this situation. So the most disturbing part, so you have here, they own all of these festivals that used to be festivals that were owned by individual promoters. And we'll get into one of those promoters in just a few minutes named Disco Donnie, because I have a little bit of experience with, with him. Um, these were all individual events that were owned by individual promoters who ostensibly at one point had control over their events, right? So they, he now owns all of that. He owns the ticketing service that you buy the tickets to the events with. So they're, they're, they're able to monitor and surveil you from the time you start looking into buying the tickets till you buy them, till you go to the festivals, you're there, right? There's also the reason that the, this article that I quoted from was talking about how they had acquired something called Periscope. And Periscope provides merchandise for these kinds of events and sells merchandise anywhere people who like electronic music culture would buy merchandise. So you have the front end and the back end, the tickets, the, the souvenirs and the things people buy elsewhere. You have the event. And the most disturbing thing that I would say is that you have the ownership of Beatport. For people who don't know what Beatport is, Beatport is an online sort of MP3 or record store. Um, that really almost all DJs buy the, port, the bulk of their music from just because it has the largest catalog and it's centralized and you can store your, you can keep, you can store the stuff there. You don't, you, know, you can, you know, there's all sorts of things you can do with it. They even, they have certain technologies that are theirs. They, they often run stages at, at these events. They have Beatport stages using their technologies. And I would say that, so you have the centralization of, of the music. And, you know, this happened when people moved from from playing vinyl records to using MP3s on computers. And there's, you know, there's benefits to that. Sure, there's a lot of DJs that travel internationally. It's difficult to lug the records around or whatever. If this was a responsible technology and responsible hands, it would be great. But mm -hmm. I fear we're looking at a situation sort of like, does everybody, I'm hoping everybody knows the online uh, movie and TV watching thing called Hulu. Hulu is similar to Netflix, but when Hulu came out, <clears throat> my, my co-host Randy had this really interesting couple on John and Bonnie Mitchell who done, done research into Hulu. And if you looked into the patent for their technology, they were actually changing some of the things about the frequencies and the flicker rates and things like that to basically, if you read between the lines on the patent, it, they were deploying a kind of mind control. And if people remember the commercials for Hulu when it first came out, it showed people's brains melting and being eaten by an alien, and then Alec Baldwin licking his lips uh, and kind of being like, that's how we roll. So they're mocking you. They're telling you that we're using this technology to melt your brain and we're going to eat you. Right. And I would suggest that there's a strong possibility, and I haven't had an opportunity to look deeply into this, and maybe there's somebody out there who knows more about the technology who has some idea about this, that it is entirely possible that there not, that not only are um, something with the frequencies being changed, but this provides a perfect avenue to put a spell or a charge on every single piece of music that comes through there. Because all of these tracks are produced, most dance music tracks are not coming out on major labels. A lot of them are very small dance labels. You know, every almost every friend that I have that's a DJ also has a record label. But in order to get people to, be able to buy them, they have to sell them through something like Beatport. And it would not surprise me if they're being run through some kind of technology and to su something akin to what this guy was talking about, where they would take the master recordings into a particular room and put a hex on them. Yep. I would say that there's technology now that can do the same thing, whether there's actually people putting, and I'm sure that there are in some cases that. I think that it's entirely possible that information is being embedded in these frequencies, mm -hmm. that there is, I think that that's, there's the, impossi the possibility that there are images visual images being piggybacked on the sound frequencies and if you want we can get into to why why i think that but you know what well we know yeah i mean what john todd was talking about was back in the 1970s and, and earlier than that that's the way they were rolling back then that's the techniques they were using so is it too much of a stretch to think that by 2016 they would have refined their methods particularly when you factor in that the explosion of electronic dance music has coincided with the move in society towards digital ways of doing things you know we live in an age now where everyone's glued to their phones and there's smart grids everywhere and wi-fi networks everywhere you know digital and electronic ways of doing things rule our lives and this music has grown up in the wake of all of that you know that the timing of it 
cannot be coincidence. This whole genre has just taken off at a point in culture where electronic and digital ways of doing things are so revered. So they would have stepped up their game in line with that in terms of what they want to use it for. Absolutely. And so you have, so let's just, let's, let's continue down this line of you have, you, you, you're at the event, you're having this experience with sounds that are being delivered through, you know, from a beat port technology that, you know, could have a spell, a spell. You have that when you're listening to it at home too, but all of that stuff is amplified when you're in a festival or a group setting when they you know, this is not even getting into the technology that has come about with acoustics and visuals and whatnot. We can go there too, because that's certainly important, but you're getting, these, you know, so people are receiving something that possibly has a charge or a spell or a hex on it. And then they're buying things from the same people at these events. I'm going to go out on a limb and say almost all of them will have some sort of symbol or sigil on them. Okay. And I guarantee you that those symbols and sigils mean something different to the people who created the product than to the people who are wearing them and sporting them about and giving them to their friends. Oh, boy. Yeah. Lo logos are a very important part of this scene. That's something I've noticed. And all the DJs have their own uh, name in the form of a sigil as well. You know, whether it's Paul Van Dyke that we mentioned or Carl Cox or Armin Van Buren, you know, when they appear on flyers, it's always the same font that's used and the same imagery, you know. The, the symbols and the sigils seem a very important part of this whole genre. Yeah. I mean, I think so. I think that goes to the, I mean, to the whole genre. I think that's part of the age. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. No worries. Part of the, sorry. That's part of the age that we're living in right now. And, but you know, so I would say that, you know, amongst the smaller kinds of musical events I go to, they may have a symbol or a sigil like that on their the record the the tracks that they put out, but it isn't something that's on all the flyers or whatever. It is, but with the, what you're with these big huge festivals and on these flyers and these really really famous DJs, it's almost like yeah, like you see like these sigils for them look like not far different from like the symbol for something like CERN, right? Yeah, like, I mean Carl Cox's uh, symbol just for instance looks like two winged sun discs out of Egyptian mythology. You know, he's got yeah. the, the, the seas of the Carl Cox fashioned in the form of winged sun discs, just as an example. And there's so yeah. many others. Yeah, I mean, and I, you know, Carl Cox is one of those, one of the DJs that he's interesting because he, he is probably the one DJ that I would say that almost everybody that I know likes, whether they're into underground dance music or whether they're into really commercial dance music or into, you know, some weird, I have never met anybody who doesn't like Carl Cox. He's, right. very, he's a good DJ. He's really fun to listen to, but he, he, he's kind of like, um, he's in some ways, he's kind of like a, a Madonna of dance music, right? Everybody mm. likes at least something that Madonna has done. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, and it's it's disturbing. I've had really a bunch of really good experiences with Carl Cox, but I've also had experiences that are strange related to it, well, you know while listening to his music that I thought were some kind of internal spiritual experience. And the more I understand, it's possible that it's an experience that was created for me. Well, there's got you to know? be a reason why these guys become so massive, why it's Cole Cox and Pete Tong and Paul Oakenfold that were at the top of the game. Because these guys all had humble beginnings. I know their stories. They all started yeah. out as soul and funk DJs playing pubs and bars around London for like 50 quid a night back in the 80s. These dive yeah. places, you know, crusty old venues and worked their way up. And then there was a point in all their careers where they just took off and they went astronomical and they became these massive superstars. And there will be a reason why they're the ones that are at the top of the game and others aren't it's the same in all other yeah. music genres there's a reason why beyonce and rihanna are the number one r&b singers and other artists aren't because they're selected for the roles they're groomed for it they're elevated up you know through the ranks it's the same thing with all the hollywood actors you've heard of why would it be any different in electronic dance music the ones that are at the top of the game are the chosen ones the ones that have been placed there the ones that have maybe done certain things in exchange for the fame and fortune it has to be that way it wouldn't be any different in that genre than in all these other walks of life yeah i think you're right i mean you know most of the events that i go to have dj you know djs that are some of them are like you and i in terms of they work at a work job during the week and they do they they play gigs around on the weekend the way you and i are able to do our podcasts and whatever on the weekend right so right. 
Okay. And some of them are amazing. And most of them are still in control of their careers and events. Although sometimes things try to get taken over, but I would say even go further and say most of the best DJs I know struggle to even get gigs outside of the city that they live in. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, and, and are really frustrated. You know, I was having a talk with a really good, my best techno friend, you know, so I've known him since he was 14 and he's an amazing, amazing DJ, but he, you know, not only is he not, willing to play anything other than what he wants to play. Hmm. He also isn't willing to play this sort of game of like making yourself seem really cool and special and have people idolize you or look up to you as the DJ. Yeah. He calls, he calls, you know, so but he, the, te the genre that I'm most into is the specific genre of techno, I li techno and house music. I'm not really into trance and some other stuff, but you know, so I'm really into underground techno and he is too, but there's this like more trendy techno that's become popular in the last several years that gets played more in clubs and at some of these big festivals. Mm. And he calls it selfie techno because he sees people like the DJ is like, it's all about what they, them up there, what they look at. People are taking pictures of them. Sometimes they're taking pictures of themselves with fans behind them. The people who are there dancing to it are taking pictures of themselves on the dance floor. It, it just makes him ill. He almost wants nothing to do with it. Mm. And this is a guy who's an amazing DJ who probably has literally hundreds, probably close to a thousand tracks out on various small labels around the world, but struggles to get gigs outside of austin texas because he's not willing to play the game yeah he's not he's part of the club i mean who really thinks that you can go from playing crusty old pubs in south london for 50 yeah. quid a night to headlining festivals where there's 100,000 people all gathered like some religious flock hanging on your every move and you're up there on a uh, podium you know dictating the entire mood of an event that kind of process just doesn't happen through hard work keeping your head yeah. down playing a few gigs and hoping for the best you know it just doesn't happen that way i mean i would i it's unfortunate but i i would agree with you um i think maybe there's occasionally one or two that slip through and haven't really done something weird or aren't part of something nefarious but once they get through to that level they're no longer playing the kind of music that people used to appreciate them for playing for and they're playing total garbage so they've sold themselves out in a different way right absolutely yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you, Emily, about specifically Los Angeles, because L.A. seems to be very key to this story. It's become the hub yeah. for EDM activity in the U.S., whereas New York and the East Coast has been more historically rooted in disco inspired soulful house. So you think of DJs like Masters at Work and Tony Humphreys and Terry Hunter, Kerry Chandler, those kind of guys. They've always stayed with the more soulful side of house. And obviously that grew up uh, quite a time before electron electronic dance music took a hold in LA but LA has always been more electronic and sort of industrial sounding in terms of the dance music that sure. is embraced and a lot of the big name DJs base themselves there now I know Pete Tong moved out there from London a couple of years ago and a lot of the big events take place at clubs and festivals in that California area so it's interesting to me considering how the counterculture scene grew up out of Laurel Canyon you know a district of LA and we've come to understand all the links to military intelligence and dark occult connections there there seems to be something special about la when it comes to these agendas and these music genres that that are nurtured there you know what, what's your thoughts on what it is about la specifically all right so we can get as weird as you want to here and if i get too weird for you then just cut me off but, sure are you so, in california by the way just remind I'm me in california. i'm in los angeles oh you're I in was, la okay great yeah i'm in los angeles i was born and raised here i've lived other places all around the country um been to parties and worked on events all, all around the country. Um, there is something very different about Los Angeles. Hmm. Um, La La Land. <laughs> it, there is, okay, so I can't, so we can get into a lot of things, but so I would say like Laurel Canyon, you know, and, and again, I started looking at dance music and I'd always recognized there was weird stuff about it. But back in about 2011 or 12, when Dave McGowan had his uh, article series on Laurel Canyon, long before he wrote the book, was when I was starting to wake up, I, mean, I had been politically awake for a while, I mean, I've always been a little bit of a conspiracy theorist, never trusted what was going on, but this was when I was really massively identifying what was going on, like on, on the mind control level. I was trying to sort out some things that were going on with me, and at the same time I was looking at his work, and it became clear to me that what was going on in Laurel Canyon, very what was going on in Laurel Canyon specifically, just in that specific location, was being mirrored in what was going on in these underground warehouse parties that I go to 
downtown Los Angeles. Right. And then being mirrored out and amplified at these large, larger clubs and festivals the same way they were being mirrored and amplified in things like Woodstock and the different kind of festivals that they were having in like the 70s. Right. Um, there's something about Los Angeles. And I think so one of the things is um, there's a massive, massive underground structure complex under Los Angeles. I, there's no doubt about it. And so I think I, I, I personally, if you want my opinion, I think it, there is a complete other world underneath Los Angeles County. Well, well. And I think, you know, in Malibu, in the areas of Laurel Canyon, all, there's lots of canyons in Los Angeles that all have very strange subcultures, not bad necessarily, but their own unique subcultures living in them. There's Laurel Canyon, there's Topanga Canyon, there's Coldwater Canyon, there's several of them. One, I, I think these provide particularly unique opportunities to experiment with, it's like an enclosed, a slightly enclosed situation. It's like a little private community, but also I think there's something going on with frequencies in some of these places because when you're in any of them, there's no cell phone reception. And you think Los Angeles is a huge city. There's lots of people living there. They'd have figured something out about that now, by now. Right. But if they're trying to use other kinds of frequencies to affect people's minds, they wouldn't want them to be interfered with it by anything, right? So I think there's some of that. And then particularly, you know, what's going on in, in the down... So I go to these warehouse parties and... The, some of these are really high quality events. You know, I went to a party last weekend that was the best party I've been to in years. The music was excellent. I didn't feel that there was anything weird going on. People, when they were stepping outside to have a smoke, were having actually meaningful conversations. This was an event that gave me a lot of hope about the, the circumstance of our scene. Mm -hmm. But I have noticed over the years that we're being observed. I, so I don't, I think what happens is at every, any given weekend, there's five, 10, 15 of these underground events going on. I think that there are people observing what's going on there. It's the kind of, you know, these are smaller events. The people are all in one room. It's the perfect, perfect environment to go see how people respond to certain frequencies, to, to, to experiment with the use of psychotronic weaponry. Um, there's really, uh, some of these, uh, some of these events are, geared around having really amazing sound systems and really amazing visual shows. And I'm not saying there's anything nefarious about people putting on the events, but these kinds of sound and visuals affect people in a particular way. And if people are interested in how to use these to accomplish a goal, they can just go and observe these events and watch how people behave when right. certain stimulants are in introduced. Right. Um, you know, so Social experiments dressed up as partying. Yes. You know, and it's, you know, a lot of time, I mean, think about it. You have a hundred people in a small dark room that are being pounded with a, a bath of sound and light, which can be pleasurable, but which can also be dangerous. You know, the, the, the difference between dance music and all the other forms of music, it is completely based on frequency. There's no, there's no, I mean, they all are, but other musics have like a song, words, right? Videos, things like that. Dance music is all just about the d different layers of frequencies. And when you're at these shows that actually have visuals, it is really just a complete bath of sound and light, total stimulation. And some of them are really good and really amazing. Some of them can even have healing effects. But I've also been to events where I feel like, you know those old videos where you see people when they're like talking about the original MKUltra experience and you see like a kid sitting in a chair with wires attached to his head being shown mm. crazy shit and listening to weird noises? Mm. Sometimes I've been to events that seem like that before. Right. You know, so it's like a it like volunteer, particularly one that I attended with, the, with the, in Austin last year with a friend who was playing. And when we got there, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was like voluntarily committing yourself to the MK Ultra chair. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well. It was kind of crazy. But so these, I think there's like, you know, so you have a room with all this going on. And, you know, I'm sure, I guarantee you that some people who sell drugs at parties are definitely working for intelligence agencies. Sorry, that I, I hate to upset people, and I know some of the things I'm saying today are going to be very unpopular. But I'm saying them because I care and because I love, I, you know, I love my scene, and I, you know, it, we have we're in the middle of it right now. The people in the '60s and '70s scene didn't know what was going on until years later. We actually have a chance to to 
take control, try and take control Absolutely. of as much as we can. So that's why I'm doing this. I'm not doing this to point fingers. We don't have to be looking back in 40 years and saying, what was that scene all about? You know, what were they doing yeah. to those kids? We have an opportunity to understand it while it's actually happening now. Absolutely. And I've had amazing transformative experiences with music that this music was the background to my waking up. I I would not be here talking to you if this music wasn't part of my life because many nights, you know, it was like I had a period of my time of time where like I was just researching and going to dance music events and researching and going to dance music events. And sometimes when I would get into like a particularly good groove with my dancing, I was able to connect things and sort things out that I had been trying to you know, to figure out and frustrated over for a long time. Hmm. Music, and particularly this, you know, they know, there's a reason they're so interested in this music. You know, you, we know that sound and light can be used for healing. It can also be used to control. And so whenever there's something that comes along, you know, I would say that I don't think that this scene was created by the intelligence agencies, partly because the scene started before, the music was actually electronic. It used to be played on vinyl. I mean, it was being produced somewhat technologically. Right, right. So it had it had organic roots before it, had, it was like co-opted and, and you know uh, infiltrated. It, it became co-opted when it became when the recognition that it could be completely created. The entire experience could be completely created and controlled from a computer. Is my okay? And I would say that so. People have probably heard of Stanford Research Institute. You know, it's like the research institute attached to Stanford University. Yep. And two programs that are very prominent there are their, pro their, their computerized music program and their mind control programs. And I'm just going to go out on a limb and say, I bet you those two departments have had a few conversations. Hmm. Right. And so this, you know, there's something magical and powerful about this. And you will have a transcendent experience. But if we don't take ownership of this, then you're going to have the transcendent experience that they want you to have that delivers you into a, you know, a new world order of sorts. Or are we going to take control of this and become completely aware of what's going on in our scene and what's going on in the world and use our transformative experience to help change the world? Which one is it going to be? It's time to decide. Well, we're missing a big part of the picture if we don't talk about the drugs and how they fit into this scene. And sure. when we think back to the counterculture hippie scene of the 1960s, it was, of course, all about LSD. There were other substances as well, but it was primarily LSD. And there's so much research that's been done to show that this was coming out of the CIA directly, you know, and figures like Tim Leary and Ken Kesey and others were being used to distribute tabs of acid at all these big gatherings and these big hippie sort of communities. So when it comes to electronic dance music, it's always all been about ecstasy or MDMA, as it's known. And when the UK scene got going in the late 1980s, it was absolutely flooded with these ecstasy pills it just seemed to come out of nowhere overnight in exactly yeah. the same way as happened with LSD. And I know it's the same thing in the US, and it seems to have been a few years later. So the UK scene got off the ground, and it makes me wonder whether it was being used as some kind of ex experimental testing ground. And they were kind of refining things in the UK before they rolled it out in the US and beyond. But ecstasy, MDMA has always been a big part of this scene. Is there any indication as to where all these pills are coming from? Uh, sure. Have you been able to uncover anything about the source of all this stuff? Because it's just exploded hand in hand with the growth of the music, hasn't it? Yeah, so sure. So I would say that um, ecstasy had a, probably an earlier start in this country than people recognized. There was actually a period in the early 80s where ecstasy was sold behind the count from, from the bar at dance music clubs. Particularly the one I'm aware of is the, is the Stark Club in Dallas. And there is a lot of roots to club scenes and things, the club scene from Dallas with dance music and with ecstasy. There's, Dallas is a strange place for a number of reasons related to dance music and also not related to dance music. Uh, but so, okay. So one of the things with ecstasy that people will notice is, is that a lot of, they are branded pills. Like a lot of the pills have like a symbol yeah. on them, which we can get back into. Uh, that also is... You know, provides the opportunity for a spell or a hex or a charge. Yeah, there's sigils also... actually carved onto the pills. A big one in the UK was Mitsubishi. There was one that used the, the Mitsubishi uh, car brand logo carved into sure. the pills. Mitsubishi, Nokia's, Clover's, Red Triangles, Green Triangles, they go on and on and on. Heaven's right. Gate, all these different pills. And you wonder if just knowing that, what, like, if that has something to do with the experience you have. But I, it also, I think... You know, 
they're they're being they're coming from particular labs, and it provides a way to be able to trace and track. Good point. And you know, a way people hear about a certain pill is good, and then then, then you know everyone wants that, and so because you know, and sometimes you know, it, like the, certain pills will be around for a while. Certain, then they'll disappear, and then they'll come back, and but they'll be different. You know, there, it provides a way of identifying what you're trying to control. The other thing, you know, I've never been super into ecstasy. I did it a little bit in the beginning, but there, there's two things I didn't like about it. I'm a dancer. I, I was a break dancer, and not so much anymore because after about 32, break dancing started to mean something else. <laughs> but I'm a house dancer, and so. To me, like it made me feel off balance and like I couldn't dance. And a lot of times it made me want to sit down. But the other thing I recognized about it really quickly is people would be really like nice to you when they were on ecstasy. They love you. Everyone loves you. You're the great whatever. And then like when they weren't on it, they were just like an asshole. And so there was something like synthetic about it. And I would say that contributes to this false oneness that they're trying to create. Like yeah. everybody's together in one and loves each other when they're on drugs and under mind control. But the rest of the time, they're just fucking assholes that are worried about, you know what I mean? Like only worried about themselves and their individual lives. It's not real. We all know at this point, anybody who's listening to this podcast knows what true community and oneness actually is. And that has nothing to do with that. Right. But yeah, I mean, I noticed over the years that a lot of times, like, people would show up in town for, like, in different cities I was living in, and they'd show up with a lot of pills, and they'd be there for a period of time, and then when the pills were gone, they were gone, and we never saw them again. And I would suggest that these are the kinds of people that you need to be concerned about. You know, just there, there was also, you know, and, and you know, let's not be mistaken, acid, ketamine, to a smaller degree, mushrooms. DMT, crystal meth, are, are all things that are also part of the party scene. And I'm not here to tell people not to do drugs. I've had tremendous, expansive experiences on the psychedelics. Um, but I also, it's very obvious to me how they can be, you know, used to create a very suggestive state for people. But also, when they're watching people on these drugs, they understand the of experience they're, they're observing they're understanding the kind of experiences you're having and then they can tool either with the drugs or with the frequencies they're exposing you to to sort of mimic in a synthetic way those experiences yeah and you know one of the things that i've noticed and we can get into this is you know at a certain point living here in los angeles i have less friends in the party scene here than i did when i lived in austin um, which sometimes can be frustrating. Like I just, you know, don't I? I don't mesh as well here. I mean, you know, I'm a little bit different. I have some friends that I really love, but I don't have a ton of friends here. And so, going to parties and dancing started to become a more internal experience for me. And about 2007 or eight, I started closing my eyes while I was dancing. I don't know why I started doing this, but what I was witnessing on the inside was far more interesting than whatever was going on outside or on the screen or any of that kind of stuff. And I started having these really interesting um, experiences. I was seeing things on the back of my eyelids, things re sometimes things related to symbols and sigils. I was seeing a lot of sacred geometry. But I was also seeing these things imposed over something that was like trying to show me something. Like I remember a particular evening where I had like a sacred geometry pattern of like a flower of life with the sort of Metatron's cube imposed upon it. People can look, look up what those things are. And under, uh, understanding sacred geometry, I would suggest, is an important thing going forward for people who, who, who dabble in electronic music and whatnot because it's, it right. can be a tremendous freeing tool, but it can also be used as a programming tool. Um, but so I had this thing going in beautiful colors, and behind it, I was in kind of like far off in the distance, I saw the pyramids of Egypt, and I could see how they made them. And it was like showing me that they were using sound, how they were using sounds to levitate stones. And this was before I was, I, I was aware of some of this stuff. I'd done some research on Egypt, but it was like a really clear picture. It was almost like I was remote viewing it or like I was there, right? Mm. And then when I opened my eyes, there was a guy tapping me and he said, what are you doing? I've been watching you for like two hours. I love the way you dance, but what are you doing? I've never seen anyone dance like that. The style of dancing I do is fairly geometric in nature. And I was telling him what I was doing. And I said, like, I was I was watching. I just told him, I don't you know what I was seeing. He said, that's funny. My name is so-and-so. I'm from Egypt. Right? That's like, right. So there's like a magical to that. But there's also, well, what is that? That's weird. Right? Mm. But I, when I was having Synchronicity, serendipity, call it what you will. <laughs> yeah. But I, 
you know, I went home immediately because I'm the kind of person that I am. And I started researching sacred geometry and I started looking into the, the, the pyramids of Egypt and everything that I saw on the back of my eyelid matched, you know, research that has been suppressed, but is, you know, likely the truth about how the pyramids of Egypt were built. Right. And, right. and so that this is really interesting. Like there's something, you know, there's something to frequencies. There's information that, you know, maybe that's what the like quote unquote Akashic records are. There's information stored at certain frequency levels and you can have access to them if you're sort of in the right headspace, mind space at the time the frequency is applied. If they don't you think if they're aware of that, they'd want to distort that? One of the things I notice is when I see these symbols or geometries on the back of my eyelids, I see them with a certain tone of colors. When I see these things on people's logos or on screens at parties or on TV, I see them with a completely different group of, of, of colors and with a more harsh geometric structure. There's nothing soft or organic about it. So my, I, would content, I would say that they're taking something that they understand to be like an internal experience and knowing that people aren't having that, they're creating a distorted version of it for them outside of themselves. Well, wow. amazing. And yeah. And so, you know, and I started working with this and I actually, you know, uh, you know, you're aware of cymatics. You know, I think that dance music is particularly conductive to that. Cymatics is basically using frequency or vibration to bring about like a shape, design or structure. Like you can put sand, you can do it with sand or you can do it with water. Hmm. You can put sand on a plate and vibrate it. When Causing it's physical change by sound vibration. Right. When it's, when it's disharmonious, it will just create a mess. When you get it into like a harmonious frequency, it will create beautiful geometric patterns that look like snowflakes or sacred geometry. Right. They find cymatic uh, structures on Saturn. They find them in water. They find them all over the place. You can look at the hexagons on the top of Saturn. And it's cymatics that's holding that in place. So mm. cymatics can be beautiful or it can be used to control and to be destructive. Right. And one of the things I started working with these visions that I had and I, you know, like, I basically, you know, I started to kind of, for lack of a better word, because I hate the idea of channeling, like, I don't know what else to call it. And I started to sort of try and, like, ask questions. And only answer I would get, and I don't know if this was just an answer coming from my inner self, my inner wisdom, or from the wisdom of the universe. It, I would, it would just keep telling me that this is the sacred geometry of space, time, and sound. And... You can do research on sacred geometry. You can do research on space. You can do research on time, on sound. I wasn't finding anybody who had a lot of information on that. Although recently I've come uh, come across people talking about harmonic geometry, and I think we're talking about the same thing. And this is, in my opinion, a gateway to tremendous um, to both thing, a tremendous amount of like uh, knowledge, but also to access to things like. Um, free energy and, and you know, using, you know, being able to use the natural energy of the universe in a healthy way to benefit us. Mm. Um, but I think it's also something that can be used to program us. And there's actually, there was a little part in your book where you talk about the triangle, um, Jay-Z and Rihanna. And then you yeah, the, the triangle, triangle of manifestation. The triangle, right, the man, the, the, uh, right. And, and so you have, I think you have, I have it here on page 77, I think, no, sorry, I have it here. You're talking about the, the magical tri the triangle and how uh, it is basic, listen to what you said. You said, the basic principle is rooted in the number of three. It is a metaphysical belief that in order to manifest something, three components must come together. These components are space, time, and energy. Well, I would say that sounds a lot similar to the geometry of space, time, and sound, right? Sure. The functioning of the components is such that if a time and space are selected into which energy is directed, a manifestation will occur. So I would suggest that that was sort of describes the experience I was having, but also describes exactly what dance music events are. They're cre they're, they're cre they create a space, whether it's a small underground space or a large festival or Burning Man. They have a space and their people are there for a period of time. And there's a level of energy in injected into that. And if we're not controlling, if we're not really clear in our intentions, and what we want that to be, there certainly is someone else who is. Well, and they're sending, they're sending energy through that space and time that's being created. What do you think? Oh, uh, this whole picture goes so deep. You know, who knew that partying is tied into spirituality, metaphysics, mind control, cymatics, 
you know, otherworldly experiences, <laughs> all this stuff just just um, just seems like the whole scene has been devised as a huge social experiment. And there must be certain parties that are keeping a very close eye on the sort of things that manifest at these big festivals and these big club and events. They must be studying the effects of all this stuff. You know, we, we, we don't know who these individuals are, but there must be a process where they're watching very closely what goes on. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I have felt that feeling, and I'm not a particularly paranoid person, of being watched, of being surveilled. I mean, think about it. it, it these people, like, they, they must know from observation what it looks like when somebody is having one of these organic experiences. So I'm sure there's been somebody, you know, the danger of me dancing with my eyes closed at parties is I can't see what's going on around me. You know what I mean? Like, there could right. be somebody, you know, sometimes when I open my eyes, I don't like the things I see in front of me. Like I see very strange people like standing right in my line of energy, almost like they're, you know, it's weird, you know, but, um, you know, so I, I've become more cautious about what I'm doing and I'm sure I'm not the only one doing it, you know? And, and so I'm sure they're observing someone who's maybe having an organic level, probably playing with it. I'm sure at some point my experience has been in, inter, you know, interfered with, but then imagine what they could learn from watching that especially if they're really surveilling you good and watching what you're doing in the rest of your life and the things that you're uncovering, the things you're looking into. Right. And then they can go distort that and make the distort. So it sort of mimics enough the real experience that people will think they're having an important transcendent experience and they'll keep wanting to do it, but distort it enough that they're never really getting anywhere with that. Mm, interesting. You know what I mean? <laughs> they're, going, they're, they're having these uh, life-changing experiences every single weekend. You know what I mean? And then meanwhile, they're voting for Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump hmm. and believing everything they see on TV. And you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't make any sense. What do you think it is that is so appealing about this whole scene to certain individuals? Because you've said, you know, yourself, you can get lost in your dancing and a couple yeah. of hours go by and you've not even noticed. And, you know, you live for the party and you're always checking out these, the, these events. And so many other people are as well. And yet it's not for everyone. So a lot of people just want to go to that cheesy, corny commercial club where they're playing all the bullshit pop music, you know, that, and have some beers. That's their idea of a great night out. And then other people want to go to maybe a hip hop club and smoke some weed and listen to that that kind of music whereas other people are drawn to this kind of experience they love doing the uh, mdma they love tripping out to this amazing music and they follow these djs like gods i wonder what the appeal is to certain individuals you know is it a certain type of person with a a certain kind of uh constitution that is drawn towards this scene what do you think sure, it is i think it's a little bit like the same type of people that were you know drawn to like the hippie scene. It's people who, I think it's people who are looking for, they're, they're, they're not finding, like there's some, they're not finding the connection that they're looking for in their regular everyday life. And they're looking for something, they know that there's something else out there besides what we see in the hard and fast, but they can't figure it out. So this provide this kind of bath of stimulation that these events and this kind of lifestyle is, um, sort of creates um, that for them. I think a lot, of, there's a lot of people, you know, not some, I don't know so much anymore because, you know, I, I, I don't go out that often. And when I do, it's with fairly like-minded, you know, adults. But I did notice when I was younger going to events, a lot of these people came from religious backgrounds and they were trying to break out of that, but they still have that idea of, of connection and worship and all those kinds of things, you know, like everything for the community as opposed to for the individual, you know what I mean? Um, a lot of these, you know, and also a lot of, I, I, when I was going to festivals back in the late nineties and early two thousands, lots of people who are, um, who are in the military liked them because there is something similar. There is this like, you know, moving in unison to sort of the orders that are being dictated by the sound. Um, and there is, I don't know, you know, I think a lot of people who join the military, are missing something in their life and they're looking for it there. I mean, I, I've never been in the military, but I certainly come from, a, you know, a sometimes less than solid background. I had, you know, so I, I, I mean, I was well taken care of and I had, you know, a nice childhood in a lot of ways, but I come from a broken home, you know what I mean? And I was always kind of a misfit and, and an outcast in a certain way. Like people thought it was kind of cool, but I was a little too much or I was a little weird or I was a little, you know. And there's and so, a family feel to these events, right? You know, you fall in with a certain group of people and they become like your family. You go to parties together and you, you share these experiences together and often that's the family that people are lacking in their own private lives, I guess. Yeah, you know, when I first started going to parties, there was a lot of that. And as I got older 
and I became more wise to the world and more individual. Uh, now, when I go to parties, you know, I have a few friends that I chat with or go with sometimes, but it's a more solitary a, a, a internal experience, and I really get, in some ways, a lot more from it. I, when I was in, in, like, when I lived in Austin, and I had tons and tons of friends. I didn't have these kinds of eye-opening, awakening experiences. I had something else I felt really connected, but again, a lot of it felt synthetic. A lot of it felt like, okay, we're, we're friends at the party, but the rest of the time, like, what are they? What is everybody doing? So I think, yeah, like I think people are, you know, we live in a world that is gross. That is, you know, people don't feel connected. People feel very alone, and people feel. Um, helpless to understand what's going on around them. And so being able to escape to another, it really is like another world. Being able to escape to another world for eight or 10 or 12 hours, or sometimes the parties last all weekend or some of these festivals last a week. I mean, literally, like look at Burning Man. Like, people go there for a week and they create this whole fantasy world. And then they come back and they spend the whole rest of the year talking about how they're going to go back to Burning Man the next year. Hmm. And literally some- living for that party. Living for, and there's something cool about that, but wouldn't it be cooler if they took the positive things that they gained from that and brought them into the real world? And sure, there are people doing events and things like that the rest of the time, but basically, people are. I even laugh because people are missing the whole point. I think about running it. They go there. They're living in a place that is not supposedly. If we're going to what they think it is, not controlled by government. Everybody's free and doing what they want all the time. But then they come right back here and they vote for Hillary Clinton and they vote for Donald Trump. And, you know what I mean? Go and back to their day jobs, pay taxes. Go back to their day job. Right. Instead of coming back and working on projects to do positive things that will help to separate us from our disgusting controllers in government. So instead, they go, well, I can just live with that the rest of the year because I get to go be in fantasy land for one week a year and maybe go to some of these other. Some of them do it the whole festival season, like from spring to fall. Right. They, live, they do this fantasy land. But then the rest of the time, they just accept the fact that we live in a, you know, a corporate government dominated world and there's nothing we can do about that. Right. To me, like the, the sign of mind control isn't people being unaware of reality. It's being aware of it and it's just accepting it, and not doing anything about it. Yeah, great points. Just before we get away from the MDMA uh, drugs side of things, it seems to me that there was a long preparatory period in uh, popular culture in the US that was getting the scene ready for this influx of, of ecstasy. Because as I mentioned, it seems to have happened in the UK slightly earlier, late 80s. But from the 90s onwards, I noticed references to ecstasy, to E, starting to get into hip hop lyrics in the 90s. Yeah. So uh, Eminem referenced it on his 1999 debut album the slim shady album uh, missy elliott in 2001 put out an album called miss e get it uh yeah. dr dre put a lyric in one of his tracks from the chronic 2001 i just took a tab of ecstasy ain't no telling what the side effects could be notorious big on the track fucking you tonight with r kelly says some say that x makes the sex spectacular uh and then if you fast forward to the current so-called hip-hop scene with all these jokers putting out all this toxic garbage that I don't check for at all. But I've got a list here of so many contemporary so-called rappers yeah. and all the lyrics that just contain references to Molly, as it's known. You know, Ace yeah. Hood, Chris Webby, Danny Brown, French Montana, Drake, Lil Wayne, Gucci Mane, uh, Juicy J. I've got a whole list of, uh, you know, lyrics here. Pop a Molly, drink some orange juice, get higher. She want to pop a Molly, man. Molly in my veins every Molly got my body feeling like I'm out of body get your little sister on the Molly pop a Molly smoke a blunt that means I'm a high roller says little Wayne you know Mac Miller's got lyrics Kanye West got lyrics so if we've yeah. got this this war on drugs bullshit that we hear about so we're told that the the government and all these uh, authority agencies want to stamp out illicit substances why is it that major artists such as this are being allowed through the big corporations to make constant references to this one particular drug why would they not put their foot down and say no more of these references because this stuff is getting out of hand if there wasn't a program in place to popularize this particular drug and have everyone on it because they hear their musical heroes referencing it the whole time. I mean, there was even this incident with Madonna who uh, came out talking about it and she changed her name to MDMA. MDMA, that's why I was just going to say that. Yeah, she dropped the vowel, so it's very similar to MDMA. And then Cedric Cedric Gervais had this track called Molly where there's a constant reference to it. So it's everywhere. It's everywhere right now. Yes. So Madonna has always made very dancey music that I that I always enjoyed to dance to. But starting with her Ray of Light album, she made several albums in a row that were really 
um, their electronic music, and some of it really was bordering on techno and trance and whatnot, starting with her Ray of Light album, which was produced by William Orbit, who's a longtime electronic producer. William uh, Orbit, get it? Going into Orbit. She's also, she's also, exactly. She's also worked with Le, someone named uh, Le, Le Rhythm Digital or the Thin White Duke, um, who's also a, a longtime uh, sort of tech house kind of producer. Um, and she, somewhere in there, changed her name to MDNA. Um, this is funny. I hadn't really, I mean, so in 2000 and I want to say five or six, Madonna at Coachella insisted on performing in the dance tent. And I happened to be there that, that year. Oh, and you'll find this interesting. I hadn't really put this together. So she was there and she actually, she did great. A, a lot of people who are dance music, it was a techno, like a techno and house stage. And people were a little iffy about Madonna being there. They're like, I don't know, man, this is going to be stupid or whatever. Yeah. She actually was very good. And, and, and they, they bought it, but she did. She was asking people to throw her ecstasy on stage, and people were throwing pills at her on stage. But you know, she was performing on the same stage, and we'll get you'll. A, a, we should just chuckle at this on the same stage with Carl Cox <laughs> and Daft Punk. And Daft Punk is this like weird. You know, their their whole thing is like they perform in a pyramid. Yeah, and they're robots. They don't yeah, know yeah. their face. Transhumanist overtones there. <laughs> Minist overtones. So we have Carl Cox with the wing disc, and she Madonna later at the Super Bowl just a few years ago performed with the wing disc around her. We have Madonna, we have Daft Punk, transhumanism, we have her pushing, you know, pushing. And I would literally say that it was after that year that the dance music festivals went from being a big thing to being a huge thing. Like a huge thing. And you know, there became no point in even going to something like Coachella for dance music anymore. It just got ridiculous. But yeah. um uh, so that is interesting. I hadn't put those things together. So yeah, she, um, you know, we don't think of Madonna as being someone into drugs. She looks, she's very athletic. She looks very healthy. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, she's famous for her workout ethic and her diet. And she so, would have been, if this was 2005 or six, she would have been pushing 50, certainly late forties back then. She was definitely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you know, there is, you know, the other thing, and I want to say this, and this is going to not be popular, but I, you know what? I'll kick myself if I don't say it. One of the things that I noticed about ecstasy really, really early on is that it feminized men. Right. And, you know, there's definitely been this push. You know, I have no, I, I have no problem with people who are whatever they are. They're gay, straight, transgender, if that's what they really are. But if we're being pushed towards something by the media, by the culture, and also by something, you know, literally, like, like I, I know guys who are totally straight guys who like after years of doing ecstasy, like were like girlier than I am, you know what I mean? And you know, I just also wonder if this is part of the softening up of society to like blur the lines between masculinity and femininity. Right. Um, Could well be. And to just like, literally like I saw, People kiss people of same sex of the same sex at parties that would never normally do that if they weren't on drugs, you know, doing that kind of stuff. So I just mm. wonder if it's all sort of part of the, you know, confusion. I call it the chaos, the confusion, you know, agenda. All of these things are vectors for the chaos that we see all around us right now. Well, I think it probably is, yeah. One other thing I wanted to mention is, this is in my book as well, uh, I'm just going into the links between the electronic dance music scene and transhumanism, as we've touched on a few times. There is an event in the UK known as the Download. Well, actually, this is a rock festival in Leicestershire, England. I mention in the book the fact that this event had introduced these new measures in 2015 as a bit of a uh, an experiment. Yeah. Uh, they'd introduced facial recognition scanning for customers, uh, citing the tried and tested justification of reducing crime. Let me just read this bit from my book. They then added insult to injury by announcing a cashless payment system for festival goers who would have to load credit in advance onto electronic wristbands known as dog tags, then have these scanned by a network of electronic readers all over the site. And uh, I, I say this is the exact blueprint for the cashless society that the elites want for nations at large, and download would appear to have been a dry-run experiment with the attendees as unwitting guinea pigs. 
uh, all the while paying for their own experimentation. And then I mentioned that there were the whole thing was very flawed. There were glitches in the system and people moaned about it and said it was a complete joke. They were having to queue up for hours to get food and drink because the, the system broke down. It wasn't scanning barcodes properly. And I say there were similar glitches just a few weeks later with the cashless top-up system at the Digital Dreams interesting name festival in toronto and notice how both events names have electronic computer related overtones and there they are trying to introduce this cashless uh, electronic way of, of doing things so it's yet more experimentation social experimentation through these events sure so there's two things i want to say to this and yeah there's been a number of events that i've been interested in that i've chosen not to go to because they're using systems like that like having to wear a wristband that has an rfid chip in it and you load money onto there so you can right. buy drinks and food Screw that. and whatnot. and um to me like i'm sorry if you are and, and these are also the same events that are having consciousness speakers there this doesn't make sense to me you're having consciousness speakers there and you're Asking people to put on a dog tag so they can be tracked and traced. There's something wrong here. Yeah. Um, I don't like that. Um, you know, I, I don't want to. But yes, I think that this is tra this is uh, in training for cashless society. This is training for being used to being tracked and traced and having people think it's cool. Like I know that some of these events, including like the music event that is not specifically focused on dance music, but is very famous worldwide, South by Southwest in Austin, they have some kind of technology where you can, you know, they have an app where you can see where your friends are because their chip is connected to some app on the phone. So you can find your friends, which makes it sound like, oh, this is cool. I can find my friends all the time, but so can everybody else. It, it, I'm sorry. I, I, I won't go to an event where I have to wear a tag. No, I won't. I don't blame you. Me neither. And even though there's things there that I, there's things there I really want to see and hear and whatever, I, I'm just, I'm not willing to give up my personal sovereignty just to have a good time for the weekend. I'm sorry. No, absolutely. I've really enjoyed the conversation because I don't hear radio shows and podcasts that go into all this stuff. You know, I've heard many, many podcasts that have discussed Laurel Canyon, and then you get researchers like Jan Irvin and Hans Sauter and Joe Atwill, you know, and those guys go yeah. into rock music and they'll talk about The Who and The Beatles and acts like that. Uh, and you have researchers like Freeman and all those guys that look into Miley Cyrus and Britney Spears and pop yeah. music, basically. But you never really hear shows that talk about dance music, electronic electronic music and really break it down the way we have today. I can't remember hearing another show that's discussed all this stuff. Uh, so I think it's great that we've done that today. So it's, 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 it's been very thank beneficial, I think. Yeah, thank you for giving me this opportunity. All those people that you mentioned, as well as yourself, have been very influential on me. And these were things that I was reading and listening to as I came to my own discoveries about what was going on with dance music. And to anybody who doesn't like what I said today, um, step back a second, go take a look at Dave McGowan's work, go, go take a look at Jan Irvin's work or Mark's work, book, Musical Truth, and then be honest with yourself for a minute and sit back and, and you won't be able to tell me that there isn't something going on with our scene. And we have, we, you know, only we can change that. Um, so I want to thank you also for your contribution and for giving me this opportunity. And, you know, this is something that I've just sort of gone based on my own experiences, but, you know, kind of Talking to you last week and, and looking into some of the city when we're here, I, I'm really considering, like, you know, making some time to dig deeper into this, to make a project of my own, you know, maybe start a blog or something that's solely focused on this, because I think you're right. I think this is an underrepresented area. And it's difficult for all of us. You know, you've had to come to terms with the fact that this scene that means so much to you and that you're a part of may not be exactly what you think it is and i've had to do the same thing you know what what's happened to hip-hop is heartbreaking to me you know i I'm, I'm a big fan of early hip-hop and i was listening to it in the late 80s and 90s and the stuff that's around now these clowns that they're parading as so-called rappers and the music has just become so satanic and yeah. uh, demonic and just disgusting you know what they've done to that genre is so tragic and yet you know i have to come to terms with it so it's difficult for everyone you know it's difficult for people looking back at the beatles 50 years later and realizing that they were a project a project of military intelligence and you know it, it's hard for people to come to terms with but it is what it is the truth is the truth and you can either handle it and you're prepared to go there or you're not just before you go, remind people where they can check out Off Planet Radio and TV, uh, the show that you do with Randy. Uh, just tell us a bit about that. Yeah, sure. So um, my co-host, uh, I'm the co-host and producer of Off Planet Radio and TV. You can go to offplanetradio.com. 
or you can visit us on Facebook. You can go to Off Planet Radio on Facebook, or you can go to Emily Moyer and uh, on Facebook. I'm um, open for respectful, constructive discussion with anybody. Um, Randy's been doing the show for many, many years. Uh, he's done some of the most groundbreaking uh, interviews on topics related to mind control and MKUltra. So people who are interested in that, I suggest look, uh, taking a look at that. I joined him earlier this year uh, to bring back in, into this uh, sort of research and conspiracy culture that we are swimming in, a uh, focus on dance and, uh, sorry, on music and arts, because we, uh, we need to enjoy life as well as just discover the truth about things. Um, so we have a show that we usually, we usually put out about three or four shows a month. Um, you can find that at offplanetradio.com. Okay, great. Thanks for coming on today. Much respect. Thank you so much, Mark. Take care. This is just for I'm picking up vibrations. I'm picking up vibrations. I'm picking up vibrations.